I'd like to welcome you to this year's Alexander Micklejohn Lecture at the Taubman Center for American Politics and Policy at Brown University, featuring tonight Professor Kate Shaw. I'm Richard Arenberg, visiting professor of the practice of political science and a senior fellow at the Watson Institute. I'm honored to serve this year as the interim director of the Taubman Center, which is a part of the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. Welcome to the many Brown students, faculty, and alumni, and other interested citizens joining us virtually. The Taubman Center seeks to influence American politics and policy through scholarship, public opinion polling, conferences, workshops, academic research, internships, and a robust series of speakers drawn from experts, the media, academia, think tanks, and public officials. The Taubman Center for several years has focused its efforts on three themes, the pursuit of security, the cost of living, and the challenges, of, the challenges to our democracy in America. This year, we're placing special emphasis on the national elections and the subsequent consequences as the nation grapples with issues of social justice, public health, education, the economy, and the commitment to the rule of law with a roster of outstanding speakers and programs. This lecture tonight is a part of a tradition of annual lectures at Brown named for Alexander Micklejohn, an alumnus and former Brown Dean. Alexander Micklejohn graduated from Brown in 1893 and served as a Dean from 1901 to 1912. These lectures focus on the theme of freedom and the US Constitution. Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas delivered the first Micklejohn lecture in 1963. We're delighted that Professor Kate Shaw tonight uh, is with us and was a part of the 2018 Micklejohn lecture, as was our moderator, Professor Corey uh, Breschneider. As we approach the presidential election of 2020, perhaps one of the most consequential elections in our history, we're particularly aware of the many recent strains on our constitution, including blows against our system of checks and balances at its core. At this time, we're also closely observing the process of confirmation by the US Senate of a Supreme Court justice nominated by the president. This confirmation process is playing out controversially in the closing days of that election. Tonight, we're honored to present Professor Kate Shaw as our speaker in the eighth in our series of featured events regarding the election. The lecture and discussion will analyze the discourse surrounding the last Supreme Court term, the upcoming term beginning on October 5th, and the ongoing confirmation, confirmation fight, and will probe what we mean when we talk about the Supreme Court's institutional legitimacy. Our moderator this evening is my colleague, Corey Bretschneider. Corey Bretschneider is professor of political science here at Brown, where he teaches courses in constitutional law and political theory. He's currently also a visiting professor at the University of Chicago Law School. Professor Brett Schneider was a visiting professor at Fordham Law School, a Rockefeller faculty fellow at the Princeton University Center for Human Values, a visiting associate professor at Harvard Law School, and a faculty fellow at Harvard's Software Center for Ethics. He's the author of a number of important books, including the highly acclaimed the Oath of Office, A Guide to the Constitution uh, for Future Presidents. Professor Brett Schneider received a PhD in politics from Princeton University and a JD from Stanford University. Our featured guest tonight, Kate Shaw, is professor of law at the Benjamin Cardozo School of Law. Before joining Cardozo, 
Uh, Professor Shaw worked in the White House Counsel's Office as a Special Assistant to the President and Associate Counsel to the President. She clerked for Justice John Paul Stevens at the U.S. Supreme Court and Judge Richard A. Posner at the U.S. Court of Appeals uh, for the Seventh Circuit. Professor Shaw graduated with a BA, magna cum laude, from Brown University and with a JD, magna cum laude, and order of the Quaff from Northwestern University, where she served as the editor-in-chief of the Northwestern University Law Review and won the John Paul Stevens Award. Her scholarly work has appeared among other places in the Northwestern University Law Review, the Columbia Law Review, the Cornell Law Review, the Texas Law Review, and the Georgetown Law Journal. And her popular writing has appeared in the New York Times, Slate, and the Take Care blog. She recently edited the book, Reproductive Rights and Justice Stories, with Reva, Reva Siegel and Melissa Murray. She also serves as a contributor with ABC News, co-hosts the Supreme Court podcast, Strict Scrutiny, and serves as a public member of the Administrative Conference of the United States. You may enter questions, uh, of, excuse me, following Professor Brett Schneider's uh, conversation with Professor Shaw, she will take questions from our audience. She may, uh, you may enter questions through the Q&A function, which will be viewable to the moderator. You may begin entering questions if you have them already, beginning now and throughout the program. Please keep them short and to the point. Professor Brett Schneider will convey the, uh, as many of these questions to Professor Shaw as we have time for. This event is being recorded for later viewing available on the Taubman Center website or the Watson Institute website. And without any further delay, I'll turn the mic over to our moderator, Professor Corey Brett Schneider. Thank you, Rich, and uh, welcome back, Kate. We wish we could welcome you to campus uh, again. Of course, we'll get a chance to do that uh, at some point in the future. Uh, we could read your CV, I think, for an hour. Uh, another thing I'll mention, too, is um, your work in the White House Counsel's Office, and I know people might have questions about that. Just to let everybody have a sense of the format, um, Professor Shaw will offer some remarks uh, at first, then we'll have a conversation, the two of us, about a number of the hot topics of the day, and then uh, get your questions ready because we'll, we'll end the hour with uh, questions from you and uh, look forward to those. Uh, so welcome back, Professor Shaw, and uh, I'll, I'll leave it to you to uh, give some introductory remarks. Terrific. Well, first, thanks so much to Brown, to the Wasson Institute, to the Taubman Center for the invitation, to Professors Ehrenberg and Brett Schneider for the opportunity to be here and the kind introduction. Um, it's always great to be back at Brown, even if virtually, but I do look forward to the chance to actually come back to campus sooner rather than later. Um, so I should say we planned this event several months ago before the death of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg on September 18th. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that questions of the Supreme Court and institutional legitimacy have taken on a decidedly more urgent cast in the intervening month. So as Professor Ehrenberg's introduction alluded to, we are obviously in the midst of a confirmation fight. Uh, the White House and Senate Republicans um, are in a full sprint to, to fill the vacancy that was left by Justice Ginsburg's death um, with two weeks remaining until election day with over 40 million Americans having already voted in the presidential election. I checked that stat about an hour ago. It was like significantly higher than yesterday and the number continues to take up uh, and will over the course of the next week uh, between now and the actual likely confirmation. And all of this, of course, is unfolding against the backdrop of not just the pending presidential election, but 2016, uh, which was the last death of a sitting Supreme Court justice, Justice Antonin Scalia. Um, and back in 2016, Senate Republicans broke with existing practice uh, and refused even to grant a hearing to President Obama's nominee to replace Justice Scalia sitting Judge Merrick Garland. And in 2016, when they did that, Senate Republicans actually didn't do that by invoking raw political power. They didn't make the argument that they controlled the Senate, they had the votes, and that was all that mattered. They seemed, in fact, to understand that a different kind of argument and a different set of justifications was required in the context of the Supreme Court. And the justification that they offered for waiting, for declining to consider the nominee, was democracy itself. 
the argument was essentially that because 2016 was a presidential election year, um, you know, they returned again and again to the proposition that um, because an election was looming, the American people should be given the opportunity to have their voices heard in the matter of who should, should select the next Supreme Court justice. Now, I would say this refusal to consider, even to consider, right, uh, he didn't even have a hearing, um, so even to consider Judge Garland walked right up to the line of an actual constitutional violation. And I think that's, you know, if you think the Constitution's meaning is forged in part by settled practices and settled understandings. But even if you're not willing to go quite that far with me, it was certainly in tension with not just practice, but constitutional values. You might even call it something like anti-constitutional, even if not flatly unconstitutional. Um, but again, the move was made and the move was defended in terms that centered popular will and that centered popular sovereignty. And that at least I think was some sort of saving grace. It seemed at least to take a position on the complex relationship between the court and the democratic process that had a degree of principle to it, right or wrong. And it seems to me actually possible that Senate Republicans were able to successfully do what, what, what they did in 2016, to hold a seat open on the Supreme Court for over a year, not really to suffer any electoral consequences for it in the Senate, at least in 2016 and 2018, in part because the arguments from democracy resonated. And even if that's not true, even if it's hard to draw kind of a causal link between the two, it at least took off the table certain arguments that Democrats might have made um, or have attempted to make if the refusal had been framed and justified in different terms. So I think the decision to rush through the confirmation of Judge Amy Coney Barrett to fill this vacancy in the midst of, right, not on the eve of, but in the midst of the ongoing election has revealed a few things, right? So one, I think it's revealed the obvious emptiness of the arguments that were made in 2016 about the need for delay, right? That in fact, it wasn't the looming election that justified the delay. It was a desire to retain a conservative majority on the Supreme Court. Um, and it was the fact that there were the votes in the Senate to do that. Um, it also revealed, I think, a willingness to deploy arguments about democracy that were opportunistic and selective and potentially maybe in bad faith. And that I think is corrosive potentially to democracy in a way that is deeper and more serious potentially than just sort of the practice of raw power politics would have been. Um, I think in addition, it poses the sequence of events that I've just described, pose a real threat to the court's legitimacy in the eyes of the public, right? So to lay the premise that the people should be heard before filling the vacancy in an election year, and then to be seeming to see to be to appear to be willing to subvert those values, to subvert potentially democracy itself, on the terms that you have established seems to me because right because of the, the the kind of paramount importance of securing a not only a conservative majority but at this point a conservative supermajority on the supreme court seems to me to cast the court as an essentially political body and to convey the message to the public that the court is essentially a political body in a way that seems to me to be somewhat new look the court is not never has an, an institution that sort of exists entirely outside of politics. Although it is true that the partisan alignment on the contemporary Supreme Court, where you have this extremely high degree of correlation between the votes of the justices and the policy preferences of, of the presidents who appointed the justices and increasingly of the senates that confirmed them, is a historical anomaly. Um, but, but the moves that I've described, I think, still do sort of create and uh, convey a message to the public about the sort of political nature of the Supreme Court that I think even against the backdrop of a degree of politicization of the court that I think has always actually existed, um, again, to break new ground. Um, you know, one more detail about sort of the, the, the Senate's rush this week and next, so it looks as though the, here, the confirmation committee vote will be tomorrow and that the full Senate vote will be Monday, which will be one week and one day before the actual election day. Again, people voting uh, all along. Um, the, prior, the, 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 the Senate has prioritized, or the committee at least, has prioritized the consideration of Judge Amy Coney Barrett, first in the face of fairly broad popular opposition to doing so before the election, but second, and some ways more importantly, where doing so is at the expense of consideration of a COVID relief package that has wild pu pu popular public support. So the New York Times Siena poll from yesterday suggested something like 72% of the public supported this 
you know, latest round of COVID aid. And you know, 72% of the public don't agree on a lot of propositions. So, so essentially to, to sort of ram through this unpopular process um, at the expense of something that genuinely would have implemented popular will um, suggests to me that something, you know, some very sort of high level value um, beyond the kind of rhetoric of sort of democracy that surrounded the 2016 election um, is clearly sort of at play here. So all these events, I think, do break new ground and I think do send um, a destructive message about the status of the Supreme Court. And this, I think, is just kind of one way into the vast topic of the relationship between the Supreme Court, the public institutional legitimacy, right? This is obviously um, a huge issue or constellation of issues, but I think that that considering discussions of the Supreme Court, the kind of rhetoric around the Supreme Court by members of the Senate, um, the White House as well, although I've been primarily talking about the Senate. Um, and so that's sort of what I've been focused on, but I think it's also true about the rhetoric of nominees and sitting justices about the court and its relationship to the political branches and the political process. Um, so all of those things seem to me to be a reasonable entry point, again, into this very broad topic of the court, the public and institutional legitimacy. And I think there's a lot to say about all of them. So maybe with that, I'll conclude my opening remarks. And I think we'll probably continue to probe all of this further as we move into the discussion section. So Corey, I'm eager to hear your thoughts on all of this. Great, thanks so much for those opening remarks. Um, and, you know, it's good to hear talk of principle in a time when a lot of people are just talking about power. So I guess my first question is, is, is there, first of all, a principled defense of what's happening? The president has been saying, and, uh, you know, uh, maybe we can brush it aside, but I'm wondering what you think, that, look, the principle of democracy is that the president is elected for four years and so not doing the duty of nomination up until the moment uh, uh, that I guess that he leaves office, that that would be a failure or a dereliction of duty. So I'm wondering what you think of that. And then the second big question that I have that I think many people would have is, uh, assuming that you're right and the president is wrong on, on principle, is it too late? I mean, are we just in a kind of war now that sort of abandons principle and can we push, put back the sort of way of thinking about democracy that you are defending uh, and how do we do that? How do we put Humpty Dumpty back together again, even if Biden wins? Some might think, uh, you know what, it's, it's just too late. We're in a sort of war-like uh, war mode of partisan battling it out about the court and its nomination. Yeah, so, so I think that, um, you know, the Constitution has sort of, you know, rules and standards in it, right? I think that's one fair, fair way to think about what the Constitution contains is I'm thinking of an, of an op-ed by Columbia Law Professor Jamal Green around the kind of Garland uh, process, who I think sort of made this point. And, um, and I think that it is, that, that that's maybe a useful way to think about that. The president certainly has, you know, if we're asking sort of in a, in a kind of rule-based way, a real rule-based mode about whether the president does or does not, like in a binary fashion, possess the power to make nominations, um, including to the Supreme Court, up to inc and including on, you know, uh, January 20th at 11.59 a.m., which is, you know, when the Constitution ends his term of office, if in fact he loses uh, th this re-election. Um, surely the answer is yes, but I think the kind of vision of constitutional practice that I am trying to advance, right, is one that suggests that, you know, that, that there are a constellation of other considerations. Um, and in some ways, my critique is more with the Senate's response to the nomination than to the president's having made a nomination at all. I mean, I, I think it was clearly irresponsible to have made the nomination in the fashion, both with the speed, which was right prior to Justice Ginsburg's actual funeral burial, um, but also with the, um, you know, in the large public event that ended up actually most likely infecting a great many people involved with the nomination with COVID. Um, so certainly it was, I think, wildly irresponsible to have done the nomination and announced uh, Judge Barrett to the world in the way that the president did. But I think my quarrel is more with the Senate's having taken up the nomination, and in particular with, you know, key Senate Republican leaders um, who were the key proponents of the theory that I was describing, and that's primarily, you know, Mitch McConnell, Lindsey Graham, um, who, who, who said again and again that, you know, kind of basic democratic values required a delay. Um, and so I think that that surely the president has the power, again, whether he should exercise it, I think is a, is, is a more complicated question. Um, but I think that my critique is more, again, with, with, with the Senate's kind of rush 
a little bit to retrofit a set of justifications that sort of seeks to distinguish the 2020 uh, facts from those of 2016, but I don't think any of them really pass the sort of facial plausibility test, right? So there's this attempt to, to, to describe 2016 as having announced uh, a, a rule that applies only when the president and the Senate are of different, or you know, the president is of a different party than the party in control of the Senate. Um, and you know, I, and I think actually, sort of to that point, the course reversal here in 2020 suggests pretty clearly to me that had Hillary Clinton won the 2016 election. Mitch McConnell's Senate would never have filled the vacancy at all. Um, and maybe that would have mattered in 2018. I'm not sure. I don't know if the Senate, if Senate, you know, the Republicans actually picked up seats, right, in 2018, perhaps at least that, you know, vote counting calculus looks a little bit different. Would it have necessarily created a backlash? I'm not sure. But but that's my answer here a little bit, go, you know, leads into the my answer to your second question, which is, can we unring the bell? Is it now the case that no president can ever have a Supreme Court nominee confirmed if the Senate is controlled by a different political party? And I think absent some pretty serious structural reform, that is most likely the case for the foreseeable future. And obviously there are very active conversations right now about structural reform if we're talking about expansion of the size of the Supreme Court, stripping of the, juris the court's jurisdiction over certain kinds of disputes, um, you know, potentially term limits. Um, I think that all of these proposals are, you know, worthy of serious consideration right now, I think, because uh, you know, it can't possibly be a durable state of affairs that will just have these sort of long running you know, many potentially multiple vacancies on the court uh, because it's impossible to get um, uh, a nominee confirmed if you don't control the Senate if you're the president. Great, thanks. I know that people are anxious to talk about this nominee and um, uh, the future of the court. One way into it, I guess, is to ask whether you think um, that she bears any responsibility in accepting the nomination. That's been one accusation that really, this is a, a constitutional failing, as you said, partly of the Senate, but really of anybody who's involved in this process. And so by accepting the nomination, she's complicit. That's one concern. And then I was hoping too, that you could just tell us what you think going forward to expect from what, what you know, all indications will be a Justice Barrett, how will she change the court? How um, uh, are basic precedents uh, going to be affected and the balance of the court? And uh, uh, certainly some of that will play into the, the discussion that you mentioned already about court packing, I imagine too. And, and various proposals, including the term limits. So. Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm not sure I'm convinced that she had some kind of obligation to decline the nomination. Um, but I do think that there were some answers that for me raised pretty serious concerns that she gave to some of the substantive questions that were posed to her during her hearing. So um, so on, on the nomination at all, I think she, you know, I, I it feels like potentially a missed opportunity to shape the way, again, sort of just the, the some of the kind of details of the nomination. I think she could easily have been in a position of power to kind of resist this sort of big Rose Garden event and, and, and some of that. But, but as to the declining, did she have an obligation to do it? I, I, I'm not sure I'm, I'm convinced that she did. Um, but I do think that having accepted the nomination under these circumstances um, and in the context of some of the statements the president has made about the necessity of filling the seat. Um, so even putting aside the kind of course reversal from 2016, the president has repeatedly suggested that it is essential to confirm a Judge Barrett prior to the election in order to resolve a case involving an election dispute. And although he hasn't quite said these words, the sort of message that he is clearly conveying is in order to cast a vote in his favor, should the election be disputed with the Supreme Court in the position of resolving some potentially outcome determinative legal question. Um, and there, I think she missed multiple opportunities to distance herself from some of that rhetoric. And that, you know, and that I found just kind of deeply concerning from the perspective of sort of legitimacy, her, you know, potential future performance as a justice. So she was asked whether the president or whether any president should publicly commit to the peaceful transfer of power. Mm -hmm. And she accused Senator Cory Booker of trying to draw her into a political debate. That's an uncontroversial proposition to which she should have answered, of course, everyone should publicly commit to that. And when he followed up, she said, well, we have this tradition of a peaceful transfer of, transfer of power and of the American public accepting the, the results of elections, but she didn't say of candidates, of vanquished candidates accepting the results. And she actually kind of doubled down on this in the responses she gave in writing to the questions for the record that were submitted after the hearing. She, she uh, turned those responses in yesterday. Um, and there was a sort of a similar exchange about whether the president has the unilateral power to move an election. And there too, the answer I think is very clearly 
no, there's no constitutional or statutory authority that the president possesses unilaterally to do anything with respect to the timing of the election. And and there too, she she said, I would have to read the briefs and you know use the judicial process to arrive at the answer to that question. And it is surely the case that nominees are circumspect when it comes to opining on kind of the particular sorts of disputes that, that might come before them. But it is also the case that it is possible to draw lines right around what are kind of the boundaries of reasonable disputes and reasonable arguments. Um, and that her, you know, seeming to indulge the suggestion that there were reasonable arguments the president could unilaterally delay the election or that he need not commit publicly to the peaceful transfer of power were really concerning to me. And you know, I looked back over some of Chief Justice Roberts' answers in his hearing in 2005, and he was far more forthcoming about even things that were potentially somewhat controversial. So this is 2005, this is sort of the height of the Bush administration war on terror. And he was asked a question about internment on the basis of race or religion, uh, a question about the Korematsu, the infamous Korematsu case, um, which he you know, subsequently actually repudiated in the travel ban case, but this was of course long before that. And you know that's not a totally abstract question. Can you imagine you know that happening and, and ruling on it? And he said to Senator Leahy, "I suppose it's possible a case like that could come before the court. I would be surprised to see it, and I would be surprised if there were any arguments that could justify it." So that's not really giving an answer, but it is making clear that he would look deeply skeptically upon arguments that that it would be permissible for the government to round up individuals, um, which clearly it wouldn't. So he potentially should have gone further um, and subsequently did after a fashion uh, in Trump versus Hawaii. But I think it's just, it was, it demonstrated the possibility of a nominee disavowing certain kinds of arguments is out of bounds. And I saw her do that not even a single time in response to the questions that I mentioned and actually a number of others. One follow-up that this naturally leads into, as well as your question about democratic, your point, sorry, about and, and your remarks, important remarks about the democratic legitimacy uh, and, and these last remarks is about the question of recusal, which has come up and, and famously in uh, US versus Nixon, Rehnquist says, you know what, I've been too involved in this presidency and I'm gonna uh, step down, so it's 8-0. Uh, I don't know that any future Bush versus Gore, Bush versus Gore two, or whatever the name of the case will be. Um, I guess possibly Biden versus Trump. Might be. Yep, yep. <laughs> um, uh, uh, you know, is, is she obligated to step down? And then I, I guess I'd invite you too to think about the dynamics. And I'll just point out to audience members. I know you you know this, Professor Shaw. But one worry was, uh, you know, after she clerked for Justice Scalia, who of course, um, join the majority in um, stopping the vote count in Bush versus Gore, uh, overturning the Florida Supreme Court's decision to allow those votes to continue um, uh, on equal protection grounds, a, a point that the late Justice Ginsburg sort of said, you know, I love the equal protection clause, but this isn't what I mean by it. Um, uh, you know, what, what role might she play? What, will she recuse? Is she obligated to recuse? Was she obligated to commit to recusing, which she of course didn't do? Uh, and what, what role do you think she might play in these, these cases? And I'll just invite you two to uh, speculate, tell us about what we might be in for in, in, in litigation around this election. Um, so no, she absolutely didn't commit to recusing, but I did read her to leave the door open. I don't think she ruled it out by any stretch. Um, and and look, I think the fact that she was nominated by President Trump in and of itself doesn't require recusal. You know, clearly, so you mentioned the Nixon tapes case, so Rehnquist recuses, uh, but Berger and Blackman and Powell, who are all Nixon appointees that participate in the case, are in fact part of the unanimous ruling against him. And you know, in Clinton versus Jones, Ginsburg and Breyer, both Clinton appointees, participate also in that case rule uh, against the president. Um, so, so certainly that in and of itself isn't remotely requiring of recusal. But I do think that, again, the circumstances of and the timing of the nomination and in particular some of the rhetoric that I have uh, referenced, I think creates a very strong argument that there would be at least an appearance of impropriety of her participating in a case, particularly along the lines of the sort that he has suggested, you know, we need them, he said, I think in the, in the first, I guess, and only a real presidential debate so far, um, we need them to count the ballots um, and or check the ballots. Actually, he said check the ballots. And surely he didn't mean you know personally check the ballots, but suggesting right there could well be litigation that you know centers on questions of counting. And 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 that also I think so 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 to sort of wrap up the answer to that question, I think that um, recusal standards are um, 
you know, that there, there are, there's a statutory sort of uh, uh, recusal requirements with respect to kind of personal financial um, stakes that there's, there are judicial canons of, of, of conduct that don't actually with full force apply to Supreme Court justices, although they say they sort of take their cues from these uh, canons, but, but they are a self-policing body when it comes to recusal and each justice is ultimately responsible for the decision whether personally to recuse in a particular case. Um, you know, her former boss, Justice Scalia, both famously resisted and then also famously did capitulate and recuse in a couple of high profile cases. So I guess there's evidence pointing in a few different directions in terms of the model she has uh, and, you know, who she identified very much as the, as the jurist that she uh, would emulate, although she was careful to say she would not be a Justice Scalia too, she would be a Justice Barrett. Um, so, so, so I think, again, I think that every, every remark the president makes that seems again to kind of forecast a dispute in which she would cast a deciding vote strengthens the case for recusal. Um, I think that's right. I think that the, you know, the case that we just had out of Pennsylvania in which the Supreme Court tied 4-4, um, refusing to grant a stay, right, to a lower court, um, a Pennsylvania state Supreme Court ruling that extended the receipt deadline for absentee ballots um, until three days past November 3rd, certainly is a strong indication that if a case in a similar posture arises and the court has, you know, on it a Justice Barrett, I think there's a decent, that either way, it seems as though, you know, she would cast a, an outcome determinative vote. Um, and so that strikes me as that, of course, is pre-election litigation in terms of how we might get a Trump versus Biden case. Um, I think the most likely sort of case would be one that involves kind of a challenge to the mechanisms by which particular ballots and, and most likely absentee ballots haven't counted and whether that's, um, you know, a Supreme Court ruling, including like this Pennsylvania Supreme Court ruling. So although the court declined to set aside the state Supreme Court ruling, allowing the receipt of ballots um, by the Friday after the election, there's no guarantee that the case could not come back before the court, again, and a court with um, a ninth uh, member on it, um, just seeking uh, essentially a cert petition, or an, I guess it could be another emergency uh, request, um, but essentially asking the court to throw out as inconsistent with either federal statutory law or federal constitutional law, those ballots that were cast or that might have been cast because they were after the election because they were received several days after the election and in a number of other states in which either courts or legislatures have relaxed the ordinary receipt deadlines, you can imagine a challenge probably by the Trump campaign um, to the counting of those ballots. And that's the sort of thing that could well end up before the Supreme Court. So I think that that, that ballot counting, absentee ballot counting, absentee, you know, sort of permissible timing of receipt of absentee ballots, those are the types of cases. And it just takes one in an outcome determinative state um, to put the court in the position, you know, 20 years later of potentially resolving the identity of the winner of the 2020 election. Fascinating and worrying in many ways uh, as we start to look to this election. Uh, I'll ask one last question, then we'll go to the Q&A, and I see people are starting to put questions there, and certainly uh, as you, you put them there, I'll do as many as I can. Uh, and this last question, I think, is on many people's minds. I'm just going to ask you to, to speculate about uh, the future of the right to privacy, the right to an abortion under Roe and Casey, uh, and then also the possibility that we're starting to hear of a national uh, law passed by Congress and signed by a president Biden, obviously Trump wouldn't do this, uh, to, to kind of reconstitute Roe through uh, legislation. Is even that in danger uh, if, if that were to happen? How conservative, in other words, uh, is, is this new 6-3 court going to be uh, yeah. with uh, Justice Barrett on it? So it seems all but certain to me that a court with Justice Barrett on it will like all but certain, nothing is certain, but, but it seems it, I would be very surprised if we did not see this court overturn Roe outright in the next yeah. two, three, four years. I don't see this court as taking the kind of pragmatic route of chipping away at hollowing out the actual ability of individuals to access legal abortion, um, which was one strategy that states have pursued and largely ha has been blessed by uh, federal courts. Um, so to you know reduce the ability to access abortion by making it difficult for clinics to operate and other sorts of restrictions, placing other sorts of restrictions on individuals and on uh, the procedure, um, but not actually you know mounting a full frontal attack on uh, Roe and Casey. And I don't I, I don't see the anti-abortion movement feeling any need to kind of hesitate. Um, I think that after the June Medical Services decision in which Chief Justice Roberts cast um, the fifth vote and wrote a concurring opinion adhering to the court's recent decision in a Texas case, essentially reaffirming um, 
the, the sort of standards set forth in Roe and Casey and striking down a law that would have you know, shuttered most of the clinics in Texas. And, and, and this was the case in Louisiana too, a virtually identical law. Um, so I think that, that with the court as constituted last June, um, anti-abortion um, activists, I think strategically would have continued this sort of um, slow and steady kind of chipping away at or hollowing out of the right as opposed to mounting a full attack on it. And I think that um, if Justice if Judge Barrett becomes Justice Barrett, there will be, you know, actual, you know, state laws prohibiting uh, abortion outright that will be, um, that will be passed or that, you know, there'll be, you know, announce, announcements of intent to enforce and such that there will be a case that actually presents the Supreme Court with the opportunity to actually overrule Roe and Casey. And I just don't think I've seen, I saw anything, of course, she declined to answer any specific questions about those cases, but the methodology that she described herself as using, right, just a, a very strict sort of originalist methodology, I think can't but get you to the place that Roe was incorrectly decided, right? There wasn't any understanding at the time the constitution was drafted and ratified um, that states would be prohibited from doing things like banning abortion. Um, and that, you know, if the only thing that would prevent you, if you think that's the best understanding of the constitution, the only thing that would prevent you from so holding would be the idea of stare decisis that the court doesn't lightly overturn its prior cases. She has written things and said things in the hearing that suggested she holds a relatively weak view of kind of, of stare, or, or, or believes that stare decisis, that stare decisis um, is not a, you know, terribly compelling consideration in the face of, you know, demonstrably wrong decisions by the Supreme Court, which I think pretty clearly she believes that Roe and Casey are. And so I'm just not sure the only thing that could potentially stop her, I think, is, you know, the reliance interest, which is one of the factors that courts are to consider when deciding when, when to overrule prior case. And she mentioned reliance interest, and she's written about the significance of the reliance analysis. But I just don't think that if you have reliance on the one hand and you know, this kind of demonstrably erroneous, and I think she believes unworkable um, decision in Roe and in Casey. I just don't see her commitment to, you know, kind of protecting reliance interests as being powerful enough uh, to overcome those other kinds of considerations. So yes, I think she very likely would cast that vote. And I think you're right. So, so I think it is, um, it is constructive for, you know, for, for candidate Biden to be talking about if there's a democratic Congress to be trying to enshrine into law some protections um, at the federal level. Um, I think that depending on the kind of structural constitutional views of a, you know, kind of newly constituted, I'm going to call it the Barrett Court for a minute, only because my old boss, um, Justice Stevens, used to refer to courts by the, the name of the most recent joiner of the courts so that were currently still on the Kavanaugh court because they really change everything about the court. So this is not to say that she would immediately become the most influential and I don't think she would become the median justice. I think she actually would be, you know, one of the two or three most conservative members of the court, I think. Um, but that, you know, she would change fundamentally the kind of identity and character of the court. So the, the Barrett court might be skeptical of kind of commerce's, con con Congress's commerce clause power to pass a law like that, one that would protect the right to access this kind of procedure nationwide. Um, so I, I'm not sure that, that that such a law would be clearly constitutional under a newly constituted uh, Barrett Court. Yeah, I mean, the question in many ways is how much is she going to be like Thomas who said in the Carhartt case about whether or not uh, uh, federal regulation in regard to partial birth abortion had th that he was open to the possibility that there was no commerce power to enact it. Now that was one it was one, and it wasn't, and it wasn't. An, as I recall, he opined on that without the argument actually having been presented right. in the case at all. Um, but certainly, that's an important, you know, potential indicator that there would be some appetite on the court, and certainly, with, and I, I think I tend to think she would be very aligned with Justice Thomas on a lot of matters. Right. Um, and so that's you know one or two votes that that might be skeptical of of Congress's authority to pass a law along the lines um, of the one that Vice President Biden has several times now referenced. Great, this has been terrific. I wish I could keep asking questions, but I also see a lot of people in the chat want to, so I'll just um, get to that and we'll transition for the next 20 minutes. I'll, I'll, I'll read to you. Um, uh, the first question is from Lee, Liam and Liam wants to know, he says that um, uh, basically drawing on the discussion that you've been having about democracy, uh, should we get rid of the so-called Ginsburg rule, I like that Liam says so-called because she of course did answer on abortion. Uh, uh, um, uh, and his point is that um, maybe, you know, this so-called Ginsburg rule is, as he puts it, damaging to the American public's understanding of a nominee's views. Um, that, and uh, he's suggesting maybe the American public deserves to know what, what, just, what future justices might think 
about all of these issues uh, and the stonewalling really in a democracy has to stop. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I, the question of how to enforce such a norm change, I think is a tricky one, but I think it's surely right that it would be better for kind of the rigor of the process and sort of the actual insight that the members of the public can glean into a nominee's likely views um, if they said more. And I do think it was striking to me to go back to read the transcript of the Roberts hearing because even 15 years ago, they said quite a bit more than we heard from Judge Barrett. I think she was probably the least forthcoming uh, nominee that we have maybe ever heard from. Um, and and I thank you, thank you for the kind of corrective about, so Justice Ginsburg, you know, did say and, and Barrett repeatedly invoked this no hints, no forecast, no previews line, but it, exactly as Corey said, it, it she definitely answered substantive questions that were backward looking about the courts decided, you know, case and settled law. She just didn't want to sort of uh, you know, preview her views about future cases. And I think that is a distinction that is an important one. And I think that it is, I, I, I think it's right probably for nominees to be cautious about giving too detailed uh, an answer to a question that really, you know, seems to suggest a specific set of facts that might, that the that, that justice may be called on to resolve. So I actually think that's fine. Um, but the unwillingness to, you know, to credit a case, like you mentioned privacy, Corey, and I'm sorry, I forgot to mention this in my answer, but, you know, her, her unwillingness to basically agree that Griswold versus Connecticut, a, an important predecessor case to Roe versus Wade, really kind of lays the foundation of the modern right to privacy jurisprudence, um, was really kind of a shocking moment to me. And, you know, that the explicit skepticism about Griswold was one of the maybe two or three kind of most damaging things, I would say, that nominee Robert Bork said um, during the course of his ultimately unsuccessful confirmation. Um, he was really skeptical of, of Griswold. I mean, he was skeptical of Brown, but maybe more Bowling versus Sharp. But but Griswold, he's you know he all he really would say was you know no one would probably enforce a law like this today, right? That that criminalized use of contraception contraceptives by by married couples. Um, but but where in the Constitution there's protection for it? Like I'm not sure. Like he really was dubious about that sort of, and he said it explicitly, and it you know in, in part derailed his nomination. Um, and so I think she you know learned the lessons from that. But I, you know it's. I think that if, I, if I'm remembering correctly, Roberts even said something like, I have no quarrel with Griswold. Um, and, and it's, it's mo mo nominees in the modern era have been perfectly happy to accept a settled law, Griswold versus Connecticut. And I think it was um, concerning that she would not do that. So yes, they should, uh, you know, to come back to your question, yes, they should say more. Um, yes, in particular, when, you know, the reason it's it's obvious that she holds views and and sometimes strong views, right? That's the reason for the rush. If if her views um, didn't matter at all, there would be no reason, say, to completely ignore doing kind of this legislative aid package um, to 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 put her nomination through. It's obviously critical, um, I think, to the kind of to the priorities at least of Senate Republicans to get her and, and her vote on the court. Um, and so it's a real disservice not to give the public a little bit more information about what that means substantively in terms of what the law you know, provides, requires, protects. Um, and so I, I think a norm change I think would be welcome, um, but I'm not sure how to do that. And I just add, I think it was uh, Ju Judge Bork who argued with um, Joe Biden, the chair of the Judiciary Committee about Griswold, and that didn't work out so well for him. As we know, he was, of course, never confirmed. I have a question from uh, Rachel Nussbaum. She wants to push back, uh, you know, not push back, but pursue the uh, suggestion, your openness to structural reforms like court packing, or you mentioned term limits. And her kind of question, her, her question to you is, Really, is there any way to get to the kind of principled idea of democracy that you've been defending uh, without some kind of um, uh, structural reform um, uh, like uh, the proposal to, uh, to, to, to do term limits? And you might say something more too, just for those who don't know. Um, I know that our mutual friend and often a professor at Brown, uh, Steve Calabresi, is uh, the, the author of one of those proposals. So I don't know if you wanna mention his or, or some of the others and uh, don't you need it? That's the question. Yeah, no, it's a great question. Yes, I think that I, I, I you know, I think that the, the last four years and the kind of the narrative that I offered in the beginning were deeply destructive to the Supreme Court. And I do think that it, a lot, you know, I think that the answer looks a little bit different or looks very different, obviously, depending on what uh, we learn about the identity of the winner of this election and, of course, the um, control of the Senate, not just the presidency. Um, but I think that it, that 
essentially that some sort of response to um, this, you know, kind of manipulation of the composition of the court that the last four years have represented is appropriate. I think it is the case that, you know, the size of the Supreme Court is not in the constitution. It is set by statute. There was, you know, there previously has been, you know, modification by Congress to the size of the Supreme Court. It has always been political when it has been done. I tend to avoid the term court packing because it really is so specific to the FDR episode. Um, and there, I think, you know, the context is not, you know, is, is, is dissimilar in, I think, certain significant respects. Um, I think especially because I, the conversation that is happening right now about court packing uh, or court expansion um, is happening without, you know, is not actually responsive to a series of decisions by a court to which the president is unhappily kind of, you know, responding or, um, you know, retaliating after fashion. That, of course, is what, 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 what was the case uh, with FDR's you know, proposal, right, ultimately unsuccessful at the kind of legislative level, potentially successful at the sort of, you know, spurring doctrinal change kind of level um, to expand the size of the Supreme Court. So, so I think that the historical parallels would be more powerful if we were talking about a couple of years from now with, um, say, a Biden administration having had several rounds of kind of big social welfare legislation invalidated by a very conservative Supreme Court, then I think an effort to expand the size of the Supreme Court like would look more like the kind of retaliation that FDR uh, engaged in. Here, here, I think actually there's almost, uh, there's more of a sort of a, a purity to kind of the discussion because it is of course in anticipation of the possibility of the Supreme Court, you know, proceeding to sort of invalidate a lot of big federal legislation if there, or not even new legislation, right? Existing legislation, you know, obviously the Affordable Care Act potentially um, is, you know, the top of the list, but there could be other, um, you know, major legislative um, enactments invalidated or a huge curtailment of the power of agencies, administrative agencies, kind of to do the range of things they do from, you know, protecting the environment to setting, you know, minimum wage and, uh, you know, overtime standards and sort of the, the, the gamut of other kinds of, of you know, protections that federal law confers, but that federal agencies actually implement. Um, so all that could be in question, even if, you know, Congress doesn't pass another new piece of uh, legislation. Um, so, so I think that talking that there, there's, it, I think it's useful actually to have the conversation right now. And I do think that, um, that it potentially could happen. The plan could actually get off the ground without necessarily sort of triggering the backlash that the FDR proposal did if it if it actually was taken up before you know we're several years down the line and we actually have seen a Supreme Court you know invalidating a lot of you know acts of either Congress or the executive branch um, as to the term limits proposal right so um, so our old friend Steve Calabresi has been advocating this idea inside the walls of the Academy for many many years but it's obviously something that has captured the public imagination in the last few years um, and the proposal that he offered many years ago um, is you know sort of in an 18 a staggered sort of uh, implementation of 18 year uh, term limit so that eventually um, there is a there's a vacancy in the first and third year of every presidential administration there too, as to you know, changing of the kind of confirmation answer norms, enforcement is where the action is. He had a Times op-ed just a few weeks ago in which he proposed, tell me if you remember the specifics of this, Corey. I think he proposed not imprisoning exactly, but basically sending Senate leadership in the White House to like a, an undisclosed location and not letting them leave until they just, they agree on a nominee who will be confirmed. Because that's the problem. If you have a vacancy in every first and third year, the Senate still has the constitutional power of, of advice and consent. And it's not clear how you force the Senate to confirm in the first and the third year, uh, the justice in order to preserve this kind of regular vacancy norm. Um, and so there, I think, I'm not sure imprisoning the sort of political leadership of the country is necessarily workable idea. I do appreciate the sort of, um, you know, kind of the imagination that it demonstrates, but I do think we need more kind of forcing mechanisms in order to actually make something like that um, a reality. And I think I, I don't actually, I haven't come to rest myself on this question of whether I think it can be done, term limits that is, without a constitutional amendment. I think there are strong arguments that it requires a constitutional amendment. I think that there are clever arguments that it can be done uh, just by statute. Um, but uh, but I think that, that, and then the last of these, we, I think gets probably a little technical, but the idea that the Supreme Court maybe shouldn't give the last answer to every legal question and that there should be serious consideration of removing certain kinds of cases from the docket of the Supreme Court, right, from its ability to decide them uh, at all is one of these, I think, slightly wonkier, but also important categories of reform proposals that is, you know, also in circulation right now. Great. Our next question is from uh, Darius, and I especially appreciate this question because it's the Micklejohn lecture. And as uh, you heard, Alexander Micklejohn, one of the most important 
um, uh, voices on the right to free speech, influential on um, the court's jurisprudence, and of course, Brown professor and dean. Uh, so the question is uh, about the future of uh, free speech jurisprudence in relation to democracy, and Darius wants to know um, with um, uh, online and the public, uh, will attempts to try to create a more civil discourse uh, be struck down by the court? Do you see its uh, jurisprudence of free speech getting more absolutist, less? And how, the big question is really, how does that impact uh, uh, democracy? And of course, that was Micklejohn's uh, question and uh, his great work, uh, Free Speech and its Relation to Self-Government. Yeah. Well, I mean, the first piece of this, so, sort of the idea of kind of regulating civility in discourse. Yeah, I mean, so, well, actually, let me take a step back. Yes, I think this is kind of a, I think it's fair to say this is a First Amendment maximalist court. Um, I'm not sure that as compared to other, you know, areas, originalism, stare decisis, jurisdiction, procedure a bit, I, I'm not sure that Judge Barrett has written much on the First Amendment. Um, and so, and, you know, had a few big, you know, not speech clause, but religion clause cases. I, I think we know that she will hold an expansive conception of the free exercise clause. I presume that she, kind of consistent with the trend of the current court, will hold a far less expansive conception of the establishment clause, right? So, you know, there are Justice, Justice Ginsburg and Justice Sotomayor last term accused uh, the court of, you know, essentially allowing the kind of toppling of the wall between church and state by requiring state funds to subsidize religious schools uh, in a decision just last term. So, uh, so once upon a time, right, there were real limits to the involvement uh, the government could have with religion um, that seemed to have been largely, you know, kind of swept away. Um, there's, you know, kind of an unresolvable tension between the free exercise and the establishment clause, but certainly, you know, in head-to-head -head battle right now, the free exercise clause is, is, is emerging dominant. Um, so, but as to speech jurisprudence, I'm actually not sure sort of where she will land, um, but I think it's probably right to say that she has, that, that she certainly has a broad view of probably all the protections, despite her inability to recall the petition clause, which is not an often litigated clause, right? She couldn't really, she couldn't remember the name of the petition clause, but, um, but I didn't really falter for that. Um, but I think, you know, I think that, that the First Amendment has been a cudgel to, um, in a lot of different ways, but certainly against, you know, attempts to improve democracy. So kind of the sort of deregulatory use of the First Amendment in the campaign finance space, I think is an incredibly worrying uh, development. Um, people are, you know, of course, familiar with the Citizens United decision, um, which, you know, struck down a lot of these longstanding limits um, on spending in federal elections. Um, you know, that opinion allowed for the kind of continued vitality of disclosure requirements. So at least like we as members of the polity get some insight into who spends what money on elections, at least, you know, a subset of it. Um, I think that there is an appetite on the Supreme Court for coming after those kinds of uh, requirements, like that the disclosure, the compelled disclosure of even campaign finance information burdens some kind of right to speaker privacy or spe speaker anonymity. Um, and I think that's something that I could well see her getting on board with. And so, so then we would see the dismantling. And there are still, you know, there are a handful of substantive regulations of money in federal elections that remain intact after Citizens United. And I could well see that, that the sort of last remaining ones falling. So that's, you know, that's, that's to, you know, a one, one method of trying to kind of improve our sort of, you know, democratic process by tracking money in, in elections. Um, and so I think that the First Amendment could well sort of do further work of, of dismantling sort of that, you know, infrastructure. Um, so maybe I'll stop there. But I think that, yes, I think that there's there there's reason to kind of worry about the deployment of the First Amendment in ways that are kind of antithetical to rather than furthering democratic values. Great. I'm going to go to Victor's question. And Victor, um, has a question about extremism and, and moderation. And he says, you know, is the problem basically politicization, politicization of the court and extremism on both ends, both um, extreme conservatives on the originalist end and then the possibility of Biden exp um, appointing on the, the liberal or left end uh, extremists in the other way. And he wants to know, isn't there a sort of way of moderating the views of the court. And then he adds a sort of second question, which is, uh, for instance, maybe there would make sense to have the House have a say in, 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 in changing the process through a constitutional amendment, of course. Um, and then I'll add another proposal that's out there, which um, 
uh, I think is um, by uh, Professor Epps that uh, you would have uh, you, know, you know, some number of justices and then the justices themselves would have to agree on some third uh, set of justices. So you'd have liberals, conservatives collaborating on, on a sort of moderate uh, wing of the court. So I'll just throw that out. Victor wants to know, uh, should that be the goal, moderation, and how might you do it, if so? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that, that I'm not sure that just one, one slight quarrel with the premise, which is that I'm just not sure that there's much likelihood that a potential President Biden would appoint justices who are as far to the left as the Trump appointees have been to the right. I'm just not sure that's uh, likely in the offing, although it could be wrong. Um, I think that there is, I mean, look, I think that um, that is in, in many ways what President Obama was doing with offering up Merrick Garland as his nominee to fill the vacancy left by Justice Scalia's death, which was to offer, it seemed like this kind of moderate and older nominee and in, in the spirit of a, a detente maybe in the kind of hyper politicization of Supreme Court confirmation. And obviously it was unsuccessful as uh, a gambit. Um, but I think there, there, you know, so, so there could be some value in it. It would just require support, you know, from, it would require sort of an agreement that there is not just kind of a power maximizing objective, I think on both sides, but some degree of buy-in. Um, you know, the concern is that a president choosing, a, say a democratic president choosing um, to kind of, you know, to try to appoint moderates to the court, um, you know, is, you know, not just bringing like a knife to a gunfight, but like and some, Jelani Cobb, I think, used a, a, a metaphor on Twitter, which is like the, the Democrats at the, at the Amy Coney Barrett hearing didn't just bring a knife to a gunfight, they showed up with a bottle of wine as if it were a dinner party. <laughs> um, so it, that's, hug that's, too, bro. Right. <laughs> a hug, yeah, exactly. A maskless hug, I should say, no less. Um, but, uh, but so, you know, it, it, I would worry that if it's just some, a proposal that would be sort of offered and implemented with a, in, you know, a moment of democratic power would be some kind of unilateral disarmament. But I do think that these kind of creative proposals um, in which you have, you know, justices from both sides of the aisle or, you know, participants from the Senate or elsewhere from both sides, you know, agreeing on compromise nominees as a certain appeal to it. I, I, I want to say that Jimmy Carter, who never got to make any Supreme Court nominees, uh, nominations, had a had an idea like that in the offing that um, that Erwin Chemerinsky has written about, but it would have been modeled on these kind of state level commissions where you have a group that has to then agree on a nominee, um, and then that group would then give the president the names, he wouldn't be bound to, you know, nominate one of those names, but he could then ask for more names. So, so I think that, again, thinking creatively about um, these fairly dysfunctional processes for selecting prospective justices for, you know, giving the public a chance to have their kind of views aired, um, and then the actual confirmation process, uh, I think that all of these are sort of useful conversations to have. We've only got two minutes left, unfortunately, and we have a huge question. So this will be a real challenge at the end. Uh, uh, Ann Connor uh, wants to know um, about various proposals to either diminish or I would just add to abolish uh, the Electoral College. Um, what do you think? Is this something that we need to do uh, given the potential for all this litigation that you and I were talking about and the complications around it? Yeah. Um, we saw this worry, you know, after Bush v. Gore, and then I guess we put it aside and, and uh, certainly coming back in the last few, few years. I mean, I think in a, in a word, yes. Um, I think I'm, I'm very supportive of, and I think that, that it, if, if in fact, and this is entirely possible, um, President Trump manages to eke out an electoral college victory while very significantly losing more than by the 3 million he lost by in 2016, but you know, you could see four or five, six more million votes. Um, then I think, I think we're already at, you know, the Republican party has lost six of the seven, the popular vote in six of the last seven presidential elections, I think is right, or maybe it'll be six if it's 2020. Um, uh, then I think we're at sort of a crisis point from the perspective of democratic legitimacy. I'm not sure that the litigation issues, I mean, you know, it's a big sprawling country with a decentralized election administration system. So you could still end up with sort of delays and counting issues and litigation, even with a truly national popular vote. It would depend on how nationalized the actual election administration infrastructure was. Um, but I do think both that um, that it is normatively desirable, and it feels to me like the sort of thing that could um, could actually attract sort of the the, the, the so po political you know, public support and political will to actually make this real. You know, the, the 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 national popular vote compact, which is this interesting workaround to a constitutional amendment that would essentially you know create a true national popular vote by through a compact among the states. 
you know, has something like 196 electoral votes already pledged to it. I don't have time to, to describe the kind of intricacies of the system, but it is an interesting creative way to sort of solve the problem um, of this disconnect and growing disconnect. And I think the sort of political geography um, and trends in political geography really exacerbates this disconnect between popular will and the outputs of the presidential election. So, um, so yes, I wish we had time to talk more about the electoral <laughs> college, but I am, I'm very much on board um, with electoral college abolition. That was a perfect uh, timing. Uh, thank you so much, Kate. What a pleasure to be part of this event. And thank you all for coming. We had uh, well over 100 people join us. And Rich, thank you so much for inviting me to do this. And uh, great to see you, uh, 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 Professor Shaw. And definitely we'll get, get you to visit campus when we're all back. That'd be great. It was, it was a pleasure to do this. Thank you so much. On behalf of the Taubman Center for uh, the uh, for both Professor Shaw and Brett Schneider for a really illuminating discussion. Uh, I'm sorry we only had an hour, uh, probably could have filled a semester here. With <laughs> Great. But uh, thanks again. Thank bye you bye. all.